In this video, we're going to look at linear functions, but now of two variables. We're going to look at formulas, graphs, and tables of values as a way to get us to understand how the extension of our linear forms to two variables might affect how we reason about these kinds of graphs. A function is linear in its formula if it has this form here, where we have one constant out front. This corresponds to the z-axis intercept. And we also have two other ingredients, an x and a y, and both with a constant coefficient for the m and for this n here. The idea is that there are no squares, no square roots, no x times y, no mixing of the variables, and no powers or anything but a constant times each of the variables. And you can see this is very similar to our one variable linear functions. The extension is that these constants in front of x and y now correspond to slopes as we'd expect, with the m representing the slope in the x direction and n representing the slope in the y direction. This can be made more concrete if we have an example. We're going to sketch our 3D axes here, and we're going to look at the graph of the function z equals 2 minus x minus y. When we say this 2 is the z-intercept, it's the value that we get when x and y equals 0. We can actually plug that into the formula up here, and we'll just get 2. And so that's what we see in this calculation here. We can then interpret the slopes. If we label our axes as we usually do, the slope of negative 1 in front of the x means that for every step in the positive x direction, we're going to go down 1 in the z direction. For every step in the x direction, we're going to go down one in the z direction. Well, if that's the case, we're going to get a straight line relating x and z, and that would look like a slope of negative one if we were just to look in that direction. Similarly, if we do the same thing in the y direction, as we increase y by one, our z is going to decrease by one. And if we increase it by two, our z is going to decrease by two as well. And that's going to give us another part of the graph that we're looking for. And if we cared to, we could also look at all the z equals zero values, effectively a contour, but it would end up being a straight line connecting those two points there. And so what we see here is a little sub picture of the graph. It's the part of a plane, so a flat or flat but not horizontal surface that would be angled up and towards the back, if that was the, we were taking this perspective diagram. Where possible, especially for graphs like this, this is the nicest way to visualize them, even though the plane in fact continues on in all the directions outside of this picture, it's hard to see that without some lighting or depth of field or contrast. If we capture it in straight lines, this is about as good as we can do for a 3D sketch. Now we're asked a different question about this though. We have slopes of negative one in both the x direction and the y direction. Take a step in the y, we go down by one in z. Take a step in the x direction, we go down by one in z. Is there another direction where we would find a steeper slope? And notice that's a perfectly valid question to ask because now we have a whole host, in fact, an infinite number of directions we could walk in if we talk about directions of motion in the xy plane. Well, if we do that, you can experiment with this yourself. Imagine finding a corner of a desk and putting a piece of paper up in the corner, like this triangle here. If we place ourselves at the peak, the slope is negative one along both the axes. But if you actually go down the middle between those two directions, what you're going to find is a steeper slope. If you were skiing down this hill, it would have slope negative one, negative one here, but you'd find it would be steeper in between those two lines. We're going to explore that more in detail in future units, but it's an important idea to get out early that the slope is not just going to be defined by what happens in the x direction and y direction. We can actually pursue or travel in any direction we like, and the slope is going to be different in every single direction, at least in principle. We can also define linear functions using tables of values rather than formulas or graphs, and we see some common patterns that you would have seen in single variable calculus.
Specifically, if we take the same step in one direction, say here in the y direction, always of an increment of 0 0.1, then we should see a resulting change that's always the same change in z as we move down in this direction. Knowing that if we're going from 2 to something to something to 8, and those are evenly spaced, we can pretty quickly get to 2, 4, and 6 matching up with 8 as being the sequence of values for this table here. When we go in the x direction, we also see that same consistent change in x in the table, and that will lead to the same delta z moving left to right, though it'll be a different change than moving vertically because the slopes in x and y can be different. We can actually see that in the table here. We go from 6 to something to 21. Well, if we do a quick calculation, that's a delta z of 15. And so we'd have to go up by 7.5 for each of these values in between. So we can capture that here. And we can even get the next value. We add another delta z of 7.5. That would be 28.5. The beautiful thing about linear functions is that same pattern vertically arrives or arises in every column. So once we have these values, we can add 2 to them or subtract to if we're going back, and getting to 9.5, 23, subtract 2 to get these ones, and last but not least, we can fill in the last column, and 24.5, and all of this together captures the linear function, and we can verify it by counting the other direction. We got these values by adding 1 and subtracting 2 vertically, but we can also add our delta z horizontally, the 7.5, and if we do that incrementally to each of these steps, we get exactly the same values. So that's a wonderful structure that we see in the table of values for a linear function. Now once we have this table of values, we can also go back and extract the formula for the function itself. What we need are the two slopes, so the x slope would be the change in z over the change in x. And we said that every time we skipped to the right here, we went up by 7.5. And the change in x was from 2 to 3 or 3 to 4. That was a change of x of 1. And so that slope was 7.5. The y slope is how the z changes when y changes. And here we always went up by 2 and by 2. The difference here is that the change in y was actually quite small. We only went up by 0.1 in each of those instances. So there, if we do the calculations, we get a slope of 20. That might not feel initially reasonable because we have larger gaps as we move left to right in this table. We're going up by 7.5 each time. But remember that the slope also involves how big the step in x or y was. Here we went up 7.5 for step in 1. Here we went up 2, but for a tiny step, a step of 0 0.1. So these are entirely reasonable values given both the... So these are reasonable values given the change in z for the change in x or y, respectively. Once we have this, then we can build our formula. Once we have this, we can build our formula. What we are going to do is put a minor variation on the formula we saw on the last page, and we're going to model it on our point-slope formula from single variable formulas, single variable functions. And that's going to look like this. We're going to pick one value to lock in on, and it really doesn't, it literally does not matter which one we pick. I'll take the top left corner point, and what we're going to do is keep that value as our starting point. And then we're going to have our x slope of 7.5. But instead of multiplying it just by x, we are going to multiply it by x minus the x value we are currently at. So x minus 2. And then we are going to add on the y values with the y slope first. And not just y, but y minus the y coordinate we were at there, 1.1. And that would be a perfectly valid formula for this plane. 
remember what this shifting here does, this negative here does. It means that when we plug in x equals 2 and y equals 1.1, both of these terms here will disappear and we'll be left just with the z value that we should have at that coordinate, which is 2. And every other change in x is going to get scaled by 7.5 to have an influence on our z. And every change in y away from 1.1 is going to be influenced by the slope of 20. We will see this form of linear functions again, but again, it should be familiar from what you've seen from single variable functions. What about contours? We haven't seen the contour diagram for this kind of graph yet. Well, what if we take a small break in our function and we're going to take the points that we had on the last page. We'll go 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, 1 2, 3, 4, and 5. And on that diagram, there are some values that we could insert fairly easily. And let's take a look back at some values that might be in common. For instance, if we had a 9.5 here, we would also be getting close to a 9.5 down at this end. And remember, contours are sets of points that have the same z value. So we'll start at 3, 1.1. That's a contour at 9.5. And we would have to go back 8. In fact, I can predict that at 1.5 it'll be 10. There's going to be a little point in here, just a bit shy of that, where we reach 9.5, just before 1.5 in the y direction. So if that's the case, we would end up with a contour connecting these lines these points rather, and we would connect it with a straight line, like so. Why a straight line? We can imagine how these points are laid out. If we were to insert an extra 2.5 column in this table, we would see all these patterns happening about halfway in between, exactly halfway in between for a linear function. And so how would we know this is a straight line? Well, if we have our z being a combination of c and x and ny, and my, then if we pick a z value, call it z naught, we are going to get a linear function of y by the time we're done. If we solve for y, we would have my is equal to some z naught minus c minus nx, or y equals some bunch of constants, all of this over m. And this will be a linear function in x and y. And this is a contour because we have specified a single z value. So when we build our contour, we are going to get straight lines. Now what else can we add to this diagram? Well, we can put the next contour on at 17. And again, if we go back to our picture, here's the 17 for 4 at 1.1. 1 .1. Where would the next 17 occur? Well, it would occur at exactly the same y value for x equals 3. So we're going to have exactly the same structure, same basic elements of this diagram. I don't want to say slope because we've already used that enough. Like so. We're going to get that as our contour for the height of 17. And if we do the same thing at 5, we would get yet another contour. This time at, tidy this up a bit this time at a height of 24.5. So what can we learn from this in terms of general patterns? Based on this example, what are properties of contour diagrams for all linear functions? Well, we just showed over here that the contours will all be straight lines. And even more than that, the slopes, the xy slope, will be the same. In other words, we wouldn't have a plane, a two-dimensional or two-variable function where we had a contour that went like this and then got steeper for different contours. That would not happen. Another way to say that is that the contours are all parallel to one another. Last but not least, they are going to be evenly spaced.
And so we have some really nice structure to these diagrams when we are dealing with a linear function. As soon as it's a nonlinear function, we get a lot more interesting cases, but there's lots of patterns that we can rely on when we have a nice simple linear function as our building block.